Welcome back to the channel, everyone. As many of you know, I am on a mission to finish the true message that Jesus was trying to teach to everyone. Now, I'm not turning this into a Bible thumping channel by no means, um, but I am looking for material to help reinforce my message to you, to empower you solely for empowerment and true freedom, true liberation, to live your fullest life, your best life, a joyful life that we all deserve. Like, don't you think so? Don't you think we all deserve that? You know? And that's why my channel is called Waking You Up to Truth, because many of the things that we know now today or that we, you know, are taught and told and shaped or molded into believing or believing in are simply not the whole truth and nothing but the truth. There have been things that are omitted from our learning and our education and our growth potential. And I want to help fill in those blanks and help connect those dots so that, like Jesus said, you too can go forth and do the same great works as he and more. Because we can. We can. And we do when we're pushed to limits where there's no other choice, right? Zero doubt. Um. So today, in today's episode, I want to share with you, um, some of you may know who he is, some may not, Paul Wallace. He is um, a biblical scholar. Um, he actually was a um, deacon and a priest and a preacher for the Catholic Church and was the one that taught the other priests and preachers how to interpret the Bible through translation. Um, and that's actually how he stumbled upon learning the things that he's been talking about. So I'm going to share um, some of his findings and his evidence and his proof of archaeological finds. Because um, I've often said that we did not come from just one God, but multiple. The Elohim means multiple. And yes, there was a woman present in that, that they have removed from our history. Her name was Asherah. And um, she's very near and dear to my heart for various reasons. And in this particular video, he's going to help you to understand how she really did exist pre-Roman Catholic Christianity being formed, okay? So I'm just going to share my screen. Asherah was a female entity, and the archaeological finds that point to Asherah show her as emphatically female. The figures emphasize the vulva, bare breasts, big bouffant hair. She is emphatically female. And more than that, she is a very powerful entity. So many people will know the famous carving of Gilgamesh from the Palace of Sargon. Gilgamesh was the crossover king, the king of Uruk, a hybrid king who was the pivot between the ET kings of the deep past and the human kings of our more familiar history. Gilgamesh was this powerful figure and the carving shows him as being five meters tall. He's holding a lion with one arm and the scale of this full grown lion, it looks like a lap cat against Gilgamesh. So it shows him as a very powerful figure, except we have a carving of Asherah 
and she is naked holding two lions by the ears. So she was honored as an advanced being, a powerful being, emphatically female, and credited with our ancestors' tutelage in agronomy. She is the one that the Jewish people of the deep past would give thanks to for our great leap forward. Cultures all around the world carry an ancient memory of humanity's great leap forward. And scientists have long been fascinated by what caused us to suddenly shift from aeons of living in animal subsistence on planet Earth, living like foragers or as hunter-gatherers, to suddenly knowing how to cultivate crops, how to do animal husbandry, how to create agricultural surpluses. Because as soon as you do that, you can settle, you can build cities, you can create a specialized society and develop into a civilization. And what fascinates me is that <clears throat> ancient <throat> cultures give credit for that great leap forward, not to their ancestors, but to advanced beings who visited us in the past to give us this knowledge. And many cultures specify that these ancient tutors came from the stars, and some specify which stars they came from. Now, now I just want to pause right there because this is emphatically the reason that I say to you that I am not a Bible thumper. Um, though there is very good information in the Bible, and I totally respect it, um, I'm more of a minister that wants you to understand our alien connections. And Paul Wallace has not only discovered the mother goddess, Asherah, in the Bible, and even pre biblical he's also discovered pleiadians within the bible's pages and the pleiadians are also very near and dear to my heart many of you know why i am connected to them many people that i know are very connected to them we have had experiences with them throughout this lifetime and beyond so I want you to listen closely to what he's about to say. Now, different cultures remember these entities by different names, but very often they're remembered as female entities who gave us this primordial tutelage in agronomy. So you listen to the Zulu people, they'll tell you about Mbabwana Warisa, who taught them how to farm and how to make beer. If you go to ancient Sumeria, the oldest culture that we know anything about through a written record and through archeological finds, the ancient Sumerians spoke about Shamhat, who met with Enkidu, the primitive human, and taught him about agronomy, farming, sophisticated foods, beer, and living in the city. If you go to Mesoamerica, you'll hear about Hun Hunapu. Asherah is the Bible's version of those figures. Found at archeological sites across the Levant, ancient clay figurines of Asherah reveal how widespread the cult of her memory really was in the practice of ancient Judaism. Asherah was known by many names. Asherah, Astarte, Hathor, the Lion Lady. The Romans knew her as Venus, the Greeks as Aphrodite. But in other places, she was depicted as an olive tree. Throughout the world of Eastern Orthodoxy, 
When a church can be found with an olive tree in the courtyard, it is the cult of Asherah that is persisting, even within the world of Orthodox Christianity. Asherah was one of many Elohim, or powerful beings, whose existence is recorded in the pages of the Bible. El of Ekron, Akek of Egypt, Dagon of the Philistines, and Yahweh El Shaddai of the tribes of Israel are all included in what the ancient biblical writers called the Tseva Hashemaim. But what was the Tseva Hashemaim? In the Eden Conspiracy, I argue that the Bible, when correctly translated according to root meanings of key words, references a whole panoply of entities who visited our ancestors in the deep past. And the Tseva Hashemaim is the Hebrew language for that panoply of visitors. Tseva Hashemaim means the armies of the sky or the airborne armies. There is a memory of advanced technology that brought ancient visitors to planet Earth, some of whom nurtured us in our development as a species, and some of whom dominated us, colonized us, and exploited us. It and again, I'm going to <clears throat> temporarily interrupt his story to just point out a few facts to you about these sky armies and how there have been wars here on planet Earth, <clears throat> excuse me, and on Mars where um, Dr. Brandenburg has actually discovered through isotopic uh, research that the isotopes that are found in places like India and um, I'm not sure exactly where else other than India, like Turkey or somewhere, Saudi Arabia, something like that. But I can't quote it for sure because I don't remember exactly. But there are places on planet Earth, is my point, where radioactive isotopes have said through scientific research, study of them, um, from from the, the ground in that area and the rocks in that area, that there was a nuclear war not nuclear fallout not like something that came from space like a full-on nuclear kind of war and we have many ancient paintings and writings that speak of these wars in the sky one of the most famous is the nuremberg germany painting that depicts all of the different types of um, ufo craft fighting with each other in the sky and this allegedly has her, Dr. Brandenburg, has also been found on the surface of Mars as well from samples that have been brought back from there. So there is actual scientific evidence to back up these sky wars is my point, okay? And there are indeed different factions. Some are for us and some are not. And in my humble opinion and research, the ones that are not are the ones in control of us right now and live on Terra, on planet Earth with us. And the other ones are on their way. Through cyclical return. It was a great spectrum of beings with whom our ancestors interacted, and the Tseva Hashemaim is the Hebrew memory of that. The arrival of groups of Tseva Hashemaim is recorded in ancestral narratives all around the world. Greek legend, Nigerian, Zulu, Efik, Edo, Norse, Celtic, Indian, Mayan cultures all speak of the arrival of advanced beings from the stars who came in the deep past, some to nurture and support humanity, others to colonize and exploit. But where did they come from? One clue could be found in the Bible, in the ancient book of Job. There's a book in the Bible called Job, 
and many Bible scholars believe it is the oldest piece of literature within the Bible itself. It's not the beginning of the story, but they argue that it's the oldest manuscript that found its way into the Hebrew canon. Many scholars believe it has Arabian roots. And there's a fascinating verse in Where that book, which I discovered when I was researching for Escaping from Eden. And it references three particular regions of space. Sirius, Orion, and the Pleiades. And the verse implies that those regions of space exercise a power dynamic over planet Earth. Now, some scholars would say the power dynamic is simply a reference to the stars in the sky and the seasons for planting and harvesting. And you could brush it off with that explanation, except there's something about those three regions of space. Sirius, Orion, Pleiades are mentioned by cultures all around the world in their ancient narratives as being the place from which our ancient visitors came. Some to nurture us, some to exploit us. Orion is there in the wisdom of the ancient Egyptians. Sirius is named by the Dogon people of Mali, West Africa, and the Pleiades by Aboriginal Australian story and Native American story. And there is a very specific connection with the Pleiades in the story of Asherah. Where do the figures of Yahweh and Asherah figure in this great panoply? So I've mentioned that there's this great spectrum of paleocontact experiences, some positive, some less so. When we get to 2 Kings and the writings of Jeremiah in the Bible, we're told that the memory of the Jewish people of the 7th and 8th century BCE, the memory of Yahweh was negative. It says they spoke disparagingly of him, they disrespected him, and they disregarded his laws. They rejected huh. his tradition. But they remembered Asherah positively. So much so that on every high hill and under every green tree, there would be installations to commemorate and give thanks to Asherah for her involvement in the human story. And so I think when we put Asherah and Yahweh alongside each other, which has occurred in some ancient carvings, what we're looking at is the two poles of paleo contact. Asherah. This is a good place for me to back up and let you see this very beginning part about the archaeological dig. Of interpreting texts. And it's very clear they're not stories about gods. They're stories about the powerful ones in the Bible and the sky people, the Anunnaki in the Sumerian tablets. The priests who knew how to read the library of Hebrew texts knew that they were full of texts about Asherah and Baal and other powerful entities who had interacted with our ancestors in the deep past. It had to be edited to give the impression of a seamless story of Yahweh, the one and only God, from start to finish, almost airbrushing out of memory the Hebrew story of paleo contact. Please go subscribe to him. Tell El Farah, seven miles northeast of Nablus, Palestine. This windswept stony plateau is located high in the rugged mountain country of ancient Samaria. Since the 1940s, this expanse of 45 acres <coughs> has been an archaeological site, oversighted for three decades by Roland de Vaux, director of the École Biblique et Archéologique Française. It was he who initiated a major excavation here, opening up an incredible window onto the real world of the Bible through an enormous body of physical artifacts. On this site, buildings, decorations, carvings, ornaments, jewelry and figurines were uncovered, giving us eyes on what the ancient Hebrews were seeing, thinking and imagining when they spoke of Elohim, 
powerful beings from the deep past. Among the archaeological finds made here was an extraordinary carving of a naus. A naus is a doorway, but completely out of context. There is nothing behind it. There is no surrounding building. A naus is a really interesting object. The conventional explanation is that this depiction of a doorway represents an entire building, but the building is not depicted. The building is considered to be implied. But if I just describe it to you and say, we're looking at a doorway that appears to go nowhere. There's nothing around it, there's nothing behind it. And yet from this thing that is only a doorway, advanced beings can come through that doorway. Now in contemporary language, we have a word for that. We would call it a portal. Flanking this particular doorway are two inverted palm trees ancient symbols of Asherah. Carvings found at the site showing women baking bread cakes indicates that Tel El Farah was a place of devotion to Asherah. Asherah was a female entity and the archeological finds that point to Asherah show her as emphatically female. The figures emphasize the vulva. Okay, now we'll move back up here. I think we were about right there. Involvement in the human story. And so I think when we put Asherah and Yahweh alongside each other, which has occurred in some ancient carvings, what we're looking at is the two poles of paleo contact. Asherah is the positive nurturer. Yahweh is the lawgiver, the dominator, the controller. And it's interesting that the biblical writers tell us that Asherah is remembered with affection and Yahweh was being rejected because of what the ancient Hebrew people remembered about what life was like under the rulership of Yahweh. So I think they belong together. When you see them together, they are representing the two poles of this very diverse experience of ancient ET contact. Among the possible locations for the origins of Asherah, one in particular is hinted at by the Naus uncovered at Tel El Farah. Carved into the Naus itself is a crescent moon and a cluster of stars. The conventional explanation is that Asherah was worshipped at times of harvest festival, and the crescent moon and the stars represent a kind of calendar identifying the time of year when these celebrations should occur. So one interpretation of the crescent moon and the stars is that we're being given a date, that what we're looking at is a calendar, and the crescent moon represents a new moon, and those stars represent a particular time in the year. And so when that constellation appears in a particular place in the night sky, at the new moon, that's the time of festival. And so the conventional explanation is that the Naus says, here was a temple to Asherah, and then in this engraving, well, that's the time of year when we have our big Asherah festival. Now, all that might be perfectly correct, but I'm going to suggest there's another layer to that symbology, because symbology is a language of many layers, and a symbol can carry different meanings at different times, and in different places. When I was first ordained, I worked in a very high church Anglo-Catholic parish. If you went into one of our services, one of our masses, you would think you were in a Roman Catholic church. It was that traditional. And so we had rituals, we performed ceremonies, we had processions, we wore vestments, which I was told all carried a Christian meaning. And indeed they did but they happened to carry other meanings as well. An ancient Jewish visitor would come, see our reserved sacrament, and say, oh, I see that you practice the ritual of the showbread, just as we do in the Jerusalem temple. He'd look at me in all my garb, layers and layers of vestments, 
and he'd say, oh, I can see you're part of the high priesthood of Jerusalem because you're wearing all the same garb. An ancient Roman would observe our processions and say, oh, I can understand all the statements about power and compliance that you're making here. Or someone from ancient Babylon would watch our bishop arrive in purple and say, oh, I can see he's in charge because he's wearing the royal purple chosen by King Cyrus of Persia. And so what we were doing was full of symbology of at least four layers. So there was a Christian meaning, but there was also a Jewish meaning and a Roman meaning and a Babylonian meaning. And so I think it's quite legitimate to look at that symbology on the Naus from Tel al farah and ask, what does that symbology mean in the language of the source culture from ancient Sumeria? It gives a different meaning. In the symbology of ancient Sumeria, that crescent moon is really the stylized horns of a bull, and it refers to a constellation, the bull constellation, Taurus. And that group of stars sit by the shoulder of the Taurus constellation. They are the stars of the Pleiades. So I would argue that this Naus is telling us a great deal about Asherah. Firstly, this is where she came. The standing stones tell us Tel al farah was a place of ancient contact, of first contact for the local peoples. She arrived through a portal from and here's a star map, the Taurus constellation near the shoulder from the stars of the Pleiades. Asherah came from a planet which orbited one of the stars of the Pleiades. I would argue that's the information carried by that Naus and that star map. Now, some might say, well, Paul, that's a stretch. That's one possible reading. And it might be easy to brush off were it not for the fact that so many cultures say that our female tutors in agronomy came in the deep past from the Pleiades. Listen to stories from the Cherokee people. Listen to stories from Aboriginal Australian people. And the Pleiades crops up again and again as the place from which our learning came in our deep past, which enabled us to make the great leap forward. Tel El Farah is such a fascinating site because before we get into the details of the Naus and what it is telling us, we have to identify standing stones that were in that place. And standing stones all around the world were our ancestors' language for marking a place of paleo contact, a place of first contact with advanced beings from the stars. An example in the Bible, is the standing stones at Bethel erected by Jacob, when Jacob witnessed Elohim, advanced beings coming from space down to the planet's surface and then returning to space via the ladder. And so he erected those standing stones there and later a temple was created there around an altar to give thanks to those entities for what they brought to the human story. So right away, the standing stones at Tel El Farah say something happened here. Our ancestors met somebody here. And the Naus is there to tell us who it was they did meet. But how did this information... So wait a minute. Do y'all remember the story of the Tower of Babel and how it was destroyed because God, Yahweh, was upset with people building that. And this is what we refer to as Jacob's Ladder with all of the religious symbolism, yet it was destroyed by Yahweh. Things that make you go Hmm. Information about paleo contact in the Bible become lost. Well, there were two kings in particular who were responsible for the cleanup 
of Judaism, which transformed Judaism from a canon of memory of paleocontact to a religion of monotheism and obedience to law. Hezekiah did a ritual cleanup where he went around, not personally, but he sent the Jerusalem guard to destroy installations commemorating other advanced beings. Josiah was his grandson, and Josiah embarked on a massive cleanup of Judaism. Judaism was to be reformed after he discovered something called the Book of the Laws of Yahweh. Now, this book surfaced during the renovations of the Jerusalem Temple. We don't know what that book was, and we don't know why it had been lost or hidden. But when Josiah discovered the Book of the Laws of Yahweh, he decided Judaism was going to be reformed around the laws in that book. The laws of Yahweh would define what was right, what was wrong, and would also legitimize his rule because those laws and his adherence to them would explain why he had authority to govern all the people of the tribes of Israel. The laws of Yahweh would explain his divine right as king, why the power of God and the will of God was upon him to rule and to govern. Now, in theory, Josiah could have picked from the whole range of beings in the Tseva Hashemayim. He could have picked Asherah and said, that beautiful nurturing entity will be our God. That will be the one we commemorate. That will be the one around whom our devotions will revolve. But no, he picked Yahweh, the figure associated with this book of laws. And the reforms flowed on from then. Now, in his lifetime, it was a ritual reform. And so we're given a verse in 2 Kings that gives us an example of what this looked like. In the book of 2 Kings, chapter 23, the narrator tells us this. The king, Josiah, ordered Hilkiah the priest, the priests next in rank, and the gatekeepers, to remove from the temple of Yahweh all the items made for Baal and Asherah, along with all the sky armies that save Ahashamayim. Josiah's ancestors, particularly King Manasseh, King Ahaz, King Solomon, had all created installations to other advanced beings. They all had to go. Josiah regarded that as idolatry and had no interest in a memory of paleocontact. He wanted to simplify Judaism into a monotheistic religion that would be the imprimatur for his authority in a neatly ordered theocratic society. So I wonder, is that why Solomon's temples were destroyed? Is that why Luxor was attacked? Interesting. Very interesting, my dear Watson. Very. We are learning so much. But the effect of his reforms wasn't just about ritual practice. It was about changing what Jewish people believed about themselves, about God, about their place in the cosmos. But before we pin too much revisionism on Josiah, we need to note when he became king, he was eight years old. Now, what? to have a king who is purely a ceremonial king, who's only eight years old, is not really a problem. I mean, some might say that's cute. But a king with real power who's only eight years old, that's another matter. And clearly, such a king has to be guided. There's a parallel in British history when a nine-year-old boy inherited the throne of England. He inherited it at nine years old from his father, King Henry VIII. And that was a moment of crisis in which two powerful families stepped forward to support and advise young King Edward VI. Now, these were families strongly invested in the religious reforms that were going on in England that had been initiated by the old king, Henry VIII. And so they see... What kind of hootspy is this? ...is the opportunity to guide royal policy and push those reforms 
forward. In the case of King Josiah, his advisor was Hilkiah, the high priest. Now, by getting rid of all the other temples, altars, standing stones, it effectively got rid of other priesthoods as well, because we forget that Judaism had many priesthoods. There were the priests of Asherah, there were the priests of Baal, and there were the priests of Yahweh. Hilkiah wanted to get rid of the other priesthoods and the other temples, and so those altars were broken, the standing stones were pushed down and broken, the horns of the altars were broken off, Figurines of Asherah had their heads snapped off and they were all confiscated so they could never again be used in commemoration of Asherah. This is as bad as the burning of the, the Library of Alexandria. Just take away the knowledge, wipe it out, rewrite history the way you want to. Judaism was paring down to a monotheistic religion with one temple, one high priestly family one king. And so there's a great centralization of power and wealth because now all the tithes will come to Jerusalem under the charge of the high priestly family. Now, within 23 years of the death of King Josiah, there was no more Jewish monarchy. And so the power over the Jewish nation resided entirely with the Jerusalem temple and the high priestly family. So this was a very strategic shift as the ritual reforms rolled on, and then in the generation that followed, a cleanup of the scriptures themselves. Clean up on our in the century that followed King Josiah, the high priestly family in Jerusalem commissioned a complete revision of the Hebrew canon. The priests who knew how to read the library of Hebrew texts knew that they were full of texts about Asherah and Baal and other powerful entities who had interacted with our ancestors in the deep past. It had to be edited to give the impression of a seamless story of Yahweh, the one and only God, from start to finish. And there's a very broad scholarly consensus that that edit was done in the 6th century BCE to monotheize the Hebrew canon almost airbrushing out of memory the Hebrew story of paleocontact. Yet within 2 Kings and the book of Jeremiah, there are clear recollections of what Judaism was before the Great Reform. Writing in the 7th to 6th century BCE, the prophet Jeremiah lamented the fact that this was Jewish practice on every high hill and under every green tree, Jeremiah 2.20 and 3.6. Similarly, the narrator of 2 Kings 17 tells us that this remembrance of advanced beings was Jewish practice in every place they lived. But alongside each other, these phrases give a clear and unmistakable picture. From every watchtower to every fortified town, and on every high hill and under every green tree, and in every place they lived, this is how normal the commemoration of the advanced beings of the Tseva Hasamayim really was to mainstream Judaism of that time. That moment from 2 Kings 23, when Hilkiah sends the armies in to destroy the reliefs showing the Tseva Hasamayim, all that gets repeated in text form as the Bible got cleaned up and turned into a book about God. And in the Eden conspiracy, I argue that the earlier story is still visible when you go to root meanings of key words. Those key words are the portals into this earlier universe in which our ancestors spoke openly about ET visitors interacting with our ancestors. Before that last edit, the Bible was a canon of paleocontact, in which our ancestors gave us warnings about the non-human hidden hand in the fortunes of humanity, but gave encouragements too for us to know that we have company, for us to know that we're part of a bigger cosmic family and that we have help. I believe our ancestors wanted us to have a better experience on planet Earth than they did. And so the education that emerges through this fresh approach 
of the biblical narratives reveals a rich education in geopolitics, cosmology, emotional intelligence, information about contact and human potential. In the Eden Conspiracy, I argue that through an approach to translation that centers on root meanings, this education re-emerges to equip us today for a better human experience. Indeed it does, <clears throat> because knowledge is power. And, <clears throat> excuse me, our Pleiadian star sisters and brothers still visit us to this very day and speak with those who will listen, that have the eyes to see and the ears to hear, to share the message, to grow, to help you grow, to help become enlightened in the correct ways. Exciting times. See you again soon.